welcome everybody to the Kona Shame Veterinary Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Work. Guys, I got a great episode today for uh, for anybody in the vet practice. And honestly, it's probably pretty great for pet owners who are uh, interested in behavior to hear as well. Gang, Dr. Amy Pike is here talking about the six M's that uh, she uses to treat any behavior disorder in practice. And guys, this is packed, so packed full of pearls. It's like a it's like a pearl bag that's one size too small for all the pearls. That's what it's like. It is. Um, this is a great one. It's short and to the point. It's about 25 minutes of, a, of us of our interview. Man, you're going to get something out of this. I can't wait for you to hear it. Let's get into this episode. This is your show. We're glad you're here. We want to help you in your veterinary career. Welcome to cone of shame with dr andy rourke welcome dr amy pike thanks for being here yeah thanks for having me i appreciate it oh man it is is an honor to have you here you are here because i asked the world on social media what is the best lecture that you have seen as a veterinary professional like who is like who's the person who gave a lecture that really you thought was amazing and and what did they talk about and you got one of the nods, a significant nod. Uh, the the feedback was something along the lines of uh, Dr. Amy Pike's lecture helped me change the way that I screen behavior cases and how we treat these pets. And it made a big difference in our hospital. And I thought, That's man, funny. no pressure, Amy. Holy <laughs> moly. Know, right? I know. I, can I retire now? Like, <laughs> yes, you should. <laughs> you it? should I be like, cynical. <laughs> Just, just drop the veterinary mic and uh, and take the rest of the night off because you, you you crushed it. You are for people who don't know you. You are a boarded veterinary behaviorist. Uh, you have worked as an army veterinarian and uh, you worked with military working dogs. You have been named one of the top veterinarians of Northern Virginia by Nova Magazine for six years in a row. You are now, uh, you actually own uh, your own vet hospital, correct? You, the Animal Behavior Wellness Center? And that is in Northern yeah, Virginia? Yeah, we have locations in, yeah, we have two locations, one in Northern Virginia, one in um, Central, in Richmond. Oh, very nice. And then you've got, you have residents of your own now. Is that we true? I do, I have little minions, four of ah, them. <laughs> you're taking over this profession. I love it. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I just wanted to come in. So so that was the, the guidance that I got was uh, you got to talk to Amy Bike about uh, about the way that she screens behavior um, in in these animals. And so I, I don't have a specific case that I want to put on you, but help me get into that headspace. Um, yeah. Walk me through. H- how should I be looking at this in practice, Amy? Yeah. So, I mean, I went to Colorado State and any of you have seen Mike Lappin lecture. He was one of my professors yeah. and he kind of likes to bring things into these little algorithms of like, you know, if this, then that kind of thing. Um, and that's really where I wanted to kind of come at this from, because not every clinician has an interest in behavior, um, yeah. nor have they had any behavior potentially even in school or in, you know, continuing education. And so like any behavior case, no matter whether it be, you know, the worst aggression you've ever seen or a puppy that's peeing in the house and hasn't been potty trained, like how do you just start from the beginning and work through any case. And that's kind of where I came at this from. All right, let's do it. I run me through your, run me through your Mike Lappin style algorithm. <laughs> I'm fired yeah, up so now. I call it the six M's. Um, so the first M would be medical rule outs. So behavior is very much a uh, rule out diagnosis. So that's why any behavior case should come to see their veterinarian first and foremost, because, you know, that little puppy peeing in the house, maybe it's not house soiling because it is um, not yet house trained. It's got a urinary tract infection. So we want to make sure that we rule out any sort of medical um, concern. And that, you know, of course, includes doing our medical due diligence as veterinarians, doing your full physical exam, um, orthopedic, neurologic, especially because pain um, can be a huge contribution to behavior concerns. Um, And then CBC, chemistry, uh, urinalysis, and a thyroid panel. So that's kind of where I start with any behavior issue. I love it. That that is super. That is super commonsensical in a, in a way that a lot of us struggle with. When when yeah. you're at a party and people are like, "Hey, my cat's peeing out, outside the box," uh, let's 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 make sure this isn't a medical issue. Is a great see, see you on Monday. That's how you <laughs> yep. answer that piece of advice. Yep. I yep. love it. Make make an appointment with your vet. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Oh, I love it. All right, great. 
So I'm 100% on board. The first one, uh, first M is medical rule up. Okay, yeah. what's number two? Yeah, so second M can be, well, I, I kind of interchange the next two. So we'll go with uh, mental enrichment. Okay. So mental enrichment is all about stimulating, you know, a brain basically. And so we want to make sure that these pets have enough um, you know, opportunities to do their normal behavioral repertoires. So like cats love to hunt. So we want to make sure that cats have the ability to be able to hunt, to climb vertical spaces, to get away from, you know, other cats in their territory. We want to make sure that uh, dogs, especially, you know, dogs of, you know, working lines and working breeds have enough stimulation that they're going to be tired. And, you know, I hear trainers all the time say, oh, you need to exercise that dog. Oh, you need to exercise them. Exercise is like the end all be all. But let's say you have a dog that has leash reactivity and it can't handle seeing other dogs on leash. Well, exercise is not going to be good for that dog, right? Taking it out on a leash walk where it's exposed to all of its triggers is not going to be any good. So how do the owners go about actually tiring that pet out? And the easiest way is just through mental stimulation. You can do trick training. You can do, you know, nose work where you hide pieces of treats all throughout the house and they have to find it. If you've ever seen a puppy after puppy class, they are exhausted. Yeah. Right. But they romp and play with their friend for 45 minutes and they're not necessarily tired after that. They're raring to go for another round. So you have to stimulate that brain. That's that's awesome. So you, you, hold on, you I'm going to be honest here. So you kind of you kind of blew my mind, which, again, seems super simple when you say it. And I'm like, I have always been one of those exercise, exercise veterinarians. That's fair. So, I, so I, I mean, just because, uh, you know, a tired dog is a good dog. I, I, I see under stimulation at, True. as a problem in a lot in a lot of pets that I see. And yeah. anyway, and, and I am that person, too. Like I'm that person who's like, if I don't get out and exercise, yeah. I, I, I start getting I yeah. getting. Uh, getting star crazy. But okay. if you think about it, Andy, like from your perspective, like if you go out and let's say go for a run, yep. you're training your body to be a better runner, right? Mm-hmm. So if we take that border collie out for a run, they're just going to be a better runner. They're going to need more and more <laughs> right, yeah. and more and more. <laughs> and so really that's kind of a self-licking ice cream cone, so to speak. We actually need to tire that brain out a little bit better. So. Well, I, I really like this a lot. I, I want to unpack this because you're right. I have literally had clients who are like, I took him and then I started exercising and walking and running, and that was great for a couple of weeks. And then he got in shape, and now I'm in as much trouble as I've been before. And so I, this is new. This is a new concept or idea for me. So tell me, give me some guidelines here about uh, these mental workouts. What are you looking for if I'm going to? If a client says to me, "Yeah, I really can't. I can, first of all, I can't out exercise my husky. I just I can't. I I I break way before she does." What, do, what kind of guidance do you have here? Help, help me get a help me get an idea in my head of, of how to do this and, and kind of and what guidance to give. Yeah, I mean, it can be as, just as easy as not feeding the dog out of a bowl or a cat. So make them work for that food. Put it in puzzle toys, um, you know, hide it. We call these adventure boxes. We take all the Amazon boxes and put kibble, you know, inside of one and then put another one in there, put some, you know, some toilet paper, or, you know, paper towels, put some more kibble in there. So the dog actually has to like go through that So rather than, you know, your Labrador taking 0.2 seconds to hoover up its food, maybe it'll take 10 to 20 minutes. And that 10 to 20 minutes is actually exhausting yeah, um, because they really have to think about it. So like I um, now as a veterinarian, not not when I was in general practice, but now as a veterinarian, I have very much a desk job because I can't move um, for most of my patients because they they will try and eat me should I make any sort of motion. Gotcha. But. I'm exhausted at the end of the day. You know, I haven't done anything physical. It's because my brain's been working the whole time. So that's one easy way. Even just 10 to 15 minutes of, you know, running through their sit down, shake, touch, you know, whatever tricks that they know or teaching them a new trick um, can be just as mentally stimulating. My um, kids love to hide the feeder toys for the cat all around the house. They, you know, fill the little, these little mice up every night and they hide them all over the house. And the cat has to, you know, hunt all night and it's not up waking me up in the middle of the night saying when's food coming, um, but it's actually getting some some mental stimulation and, and performing some of those normal behaviors that it would otherwise. I love this. And, and, I, and I love your example of, of the Amazon boxes and things like that. I'm 100% running through in my mind how to put this together. Are there toys that you like specifically for dogs and cats? Are there certain brands where you're like, yeah, that's what I recommend or things like that to help get people started? Yeah, there's there's so many your head would spin. I mean, there's some really good enrichment uh, social media Facebook groups out there. But one of my favorites for cats is the Doc and Phoebe's mice. Those are what my cats love um, to to find. And then 
really for dogs, I do a lot of DIY for dogs because I have pretty destructive dogs. So I'm going to make something that they can destroy. But there are a lot of good Kong makes a bunch, not even just, you know, your normal Kong that you stuff, but like the one that has a little hole on the side, I think it's called the Kong wobbler, um, or you can like, you know, manipulate it and topple that food out. I, uh, so I have, I'm a big Kong guy. I've got, a, I used to have, I, I looked over to the side. I used to have a shelf of Kong that's kind of display, but my uh-huh. golden doodle uh, has just been helping himself <laughs> for the last couple of months. And like, by the time I find it, it's, it's like, too hey, late. I need enrichment, oh, dad. He just, oh, a hundred, he just kind of, he, he's smart. He, he waits for me to leave and then he just helps himself. But um, my nephew, who's uh, two years old, came to visit uh, a little while ago and he found those big Kong wobblers and there was two of them. And that kid just toddled through the house holding these two Kong wobblers that were as big as him. It was absolutely awesome. Uh, so anyway, all right, cool. I love it. Um, I'll, I'll stick some some links in the show notes for at least for Kong stuff and for the uh, Doc and Phoebe. All right, cool. So we've got uh, we've got medical rule out. We got a mental enrichment. Where are we going from here? The third one's going to be management. So management is just like you know staunching the bleeding. We put a tourniquet on or put a bandage on something, right? Maybe we don't have time to explore that wound a little further, but we need to stop that bleeding immediately. So management is what's going to do that for behavior. So we are going to try and avoid the triggers. So whatever that trigger may be. So let's say the dog is leash reactive to other dogs. All right, we're going to avoid leash walks as much as possible, or we're going to take the dog to a remote trail or, you know, during COVID, it was nice because the schools were empty. People could go to the school grounds and walk around church parking lots. Um, are a really good place. Business centers that are, you know, empty and void of of employees right now also make great areas. So that's just going to prevent the practice of that problematic behavior. So number one, practice, we know practice makes perfect, right? So if we stop the practice of that behavior, the dog's not going to get any sort of reinforcement or punishment for it. Um, but it will allow us then to be able to train something in the future, which we'll talk about. Um, but the other thing too, is especially with aggression, because that's the number one thing that I see as a behaviorist, it's going to keep everybody safe. And if we can keep everyone safe, then we can keep that pet in the home until we're able to implement treatment because behavior treatment isn't an overnight thing. I mean, I know owners obviously come in and they want the magic wand, um, but it doesn't happen and it's gonna take some time. So we are going to have to implement management in the meantime. That totally makes sense. So so basically what I'm hearing when you say, when you say management is, let's not let these problems detonate and just put ourselves in the, in the, in a in a safe place uh, while we while we work on the mechanism behind the scenes is that is that exactly. pretty accurate? Okay, yep. cool, great. Yep. I like Absolutely. that. What does that um, what does that look like in things like um, in things like house soiling and cats or or things yeah. like that? I, I see that do- I see that in dogs, and I think dog triggers seem to be much more known and recognized. And cat triggers, I'm not saying they're not there. I'm saying pet owners often don't see them or get them. True. And then I get a lot of I don't know why he's doing this. Uh, help help me with that. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things, obviously, the owner is going to want to stop the urination or defecation on their carpet, right? So so if we maybe just confine that cat to a bathroom with its own litter box, food and water, or a basement, maybe that's unfinished, somewhere where even if the behavior happens, it's not going to be as detrimental to the oriental rug or gotcha. you know, something you know, like that. But also inner cat aggression is a big component, whether it be obvious or um, subtle in a multi-cat household. So separating all the cats until we kind of figure out what the root cause is um, Mm -hmm. for the elimination. But that would be one other way that we can go about that. That's awesome. Okay, that totally makes sense. Okay, great. I'm on board with management. Where are we going from here? (laughs) Excellent. So the next one would be modification of behavior. So this is teaching either the animal an alternate behavior to the one that we, you know, don't want, let's say, a dog is jumping on guests. All right, we're going to teach it to sit down for attention instead. Um, Or if we're talking about something that is fear, anxiety, or stress related, we're going to desensitize them and counter condition them to that trigger. So so this is all the training aspect of what I do. I equate it to the therapy um, in humans is like, you know, you have to put in the work and this is the work that's going to take the time um, in order to teach those different behaviors. Perfect. I'm making copious notes over I here. Love it. Like, oh, this is really good. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's wonderful. Guys, I just got to jump in here real fast and give a quick shout out 
to Penfield the Pet Hospital. Guys, we have transcripts for this podcast. That's right. At DrAndyWork.com, you can find transcripts to all of the Kona Shame Veterinary Podcast episodes. Banfield has sponsored that. They have made it possible to increase accessibility and inclusivity in our profession. I'm so grateful to them for that. We could not do it without them. Um, gang, I hope you'll take advantage of this resource. Uh, feel free to check it out. It's not hard to find. We try to make it super easy to find. Anyway, I just got to say thanks to those guys. And I want you guys to know that those transcripts are there uh, if you need them. Gang, let's get back into this episode. Is there anything that we need to set? Help me Help me when we start talking about modification of behavior. What expectations do you try to put into the mind of the pet owner? Because this is this is a lot of work. It's just it's easy to be like, we're just gonna, we're just going to we're going <laughs> to we're going to alternate your dog's behavior so he doesn't jump up on people yeah. when he come to the house. And they're like, great, that sounds like a busy day. And it's like, oh, no, no, oh, no. Help, help, help me with that. How do you do that? Well, and I always tell people, too, like I'm obviously busy, right? Have family practice. Sure everything. Um, and so if management can solve a lot of your issues, like let's say it is this jumping dog and you just say, Hey, I'm going to just put the dog away when I let people in and then it can't jump on people. Yeah. If that's all you want to do, that's, that's fine. I'm totally cool with that. But if you do want to do the modification of the behavior, then we are going to have to train that it's going to take consistency. Um, it's going to take using positive reinforcement, um, uh, based training. So making sure we reward that pet for that alternate behavior. Um, and really honestly, like, even if it's, if it's something as simple as like jumping up, we could probably teach that in one session, but getting the consistency under our belts is going to be the key. And that may take weeks to months, depending on how long this animal has been doing this behavior. If this has been, you know, seven years running and mm -hmm. now we're trying to change it, it's going to take a little bit longer because there's a lot of reinforcement history there. But if this is a new puppy, that's going to be simple. Okay. I like that. That makes that makes sense. I'm I'm totally on board with this. I, I love the way this program is coming together. So number five. Yeah. So number five would be medication and products. And that's if it is something that's fear, anxiety, and stress related. So the house soiling puppy that we've ruled out medical that is just a puppy that has never had potty training before, that's not going to need medication and products, right? right? So... I'm talking about uh, dogs and cats with anxiety disorders. And so this can be anything from our nutraceuticals like Anxetine and Zilkeen. Am I allowed to say? Yeah, Brandy? absolutely. Okay. Yeah, you can definitely. Yeah, right, that, just yeah, totally. That <laughs> yep. No, no, you're all good. <laughs> good. And then we can use the pheromones like Adaptal and Feel Away um, all the way up to our, you know, psychotropic medications. And we have a few that are FDA approved in dogs. We've got Reconcile and Clomacom, which are FDA approved for separation anxiety in dogs. We've got Cilio Gel, which is approved for noise and storm phobias. Um, we've got Anapril, which um, can be hard to find, but it is approved for cognitive dysfunction in dogs. And hopefully in the next year or so, we will get Pexion, which is a benzodiazepine uh, that is approved for noise phobias as well. So, but other than that, we're using everything off label um, okay. in our veterinary patients. And we use all of the same psychotropic medication that they do in human medicine now. So we have lots and lots of options moving forward. Talk, talk to me about the timing of this. So, so when we're laying out this program, uh, number four, modification of behavior, comes before number five, which is uh, medication. Is that, is that how it goes in practice? Uh, so I, I know there's some difference here in, in, in behaviors and how they do it. I've, I'm really interested in this of when do I introduce medication? I think I've been guilty earlier in my career of, of sitting on medication too long when I had I introduced it earlier on with the training, I could have been more successful. And so I'm still parsing that. Can, can you comment a little bit on, on the timing of those things together? Absolutely. That that can be a little bit tricky. So the reason that I have it in this order in my talk is because there are some behaviors that aren't going to need medication and products. And so, you know, of course, I didn't want to put that first. But for the cases that typically see me, I'm not seeing the jumping dog at the door, right? Because I'm seeing the aggressive dog at the door. And for the most part, if the animal cannot be kept under threshold, meaning they are they the owners can't manage the environment appropriately, um, maybe they live in an apartment and the dog has to go outside, um, you know, to potty and, and they're leash reactive to every dog or they're reactive to strangers. And, you know, they also live in an apartment, have to take the elevator 13 floors with other people. I am likely going to have to need some sort of medication in order to keep that animal under threshold because nobody can learn when they're highly aroused. So if you are stressed, learning doesn't take place. And if the animal is reacting Nothing is happening between those ears except fight or flight. And so we need to make sure that 
those medications get on board sooner rather than later, because otherwise they're just going to spin their wheels with training and get frustrated. Okay. All right. Can I ask you about a specific case that, yeah, that this is going to come together? Okay. So this is sort of interesting. And it's a case that I, it bothered me a lot because I didn't feel like I had good tools in my toolbox to deal with it, or maybe I didn't process it at the time, you know, cause you're in the exam room, the person's laying out. I had a case, it's been, it's been some time ago now, so I feel comfortable sort of telling you about it, but it basically it was a, a person who had an 11 month old German shepherd in, in a apartment complex and the dog was barking continuously and the neighbors were complaining. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I talked, I talked about uh, exercising the dog a lot, which I think is true. Can, can you talk to me a little bit about that? So is that, and of course the owner said, she said, I want medications for this dog. And I did not like that. But now that I'm listening to you, I'm going, well, is this dog hyperstimulated because it's being crated? And how do you train this dog that's having this reaction? So anyway, yeah, it, help, help me just sort of process that as I, as I think back. Yeah, I mean, I think the the sort of the trouble with barking is you're going to have to take a little bit deeper detailed history because sure. barking has so many motivations. Um, but regardless, if it is, you know, pretty much all daytime hours, there's probably a likely, you know, some sort of noise stimulus that they're hearing other things outside, um, potentially separation anxiety. And like you said, if we are unable, like if that dog cannot even focus on like owner trying to give it a treat when it's quiet and it just continually is barking, it is going to need medication. Okay, that um, helps. Now, I might, of course, I'm going to do management, mental enrichment, all that stuff at the same time, right? It's never, as I tell my owners, it's never medication in a vacuum. Um, but the medication is going to allow us to be able to proceed um, in a much better fashion and much faster. So. Well, I, I come out of this interview thinking about that case and thinking about mental enrichment is definitely the tool that I wish I'd had handy in my pocket that I could have brought in as well as the exercise stuff that I talked about because that dog does need exercise. But but that was going to be another thing. So anyway, that's super helpful for me that I just I'm running. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's listening to this, who's running back to their Hopefully. own cases and going, mm, I, I could have taken that one a different way. Anyway, well, that's that's why we do these. All right, perfect. And then that brings us to number six. What do you got? Yeah. And number six is monitor and modify the plan because there is no behavior plan that goes out the door that's perfect, um, especially when it comes to uh, medication and behavior modification. Well, actually, I should take that back every single one of these things, because no matter what I give owners, they could come back to me and be like, you know, I can't crate that dog. It, mm -hmm. Number one, it's panicked. OK, we're going to have to work on crate training. Right. Um, or I can't hold the dog back when um, people are coming to the door because it then redirects and bites at me. All right. Well, that's something we're going to have to modify. Right. So. So no plan that goes out that door is going to be perfect from the get-go. And so it's very, very key. Behavior cases are probably some of the most um, intense as far as follow-up is concerned because we need to be in touch, regular touch with these owners to make sure that they are on track and that, you know, everything is proceeding um, as as we want it to be. And, and certainly with medications, I... Yes, we pick medications based off of what, um, you know, clinical signs we're seeing, what neurotransmitters we want to target, et cetera. But that doesn't, it's up to that brain ultimately whether they respond to it or not. And so I can pick the greatest medication based on the textbook chapter. Um, if that dog hasn't read the textbook chapter, then I'm going to have to alter that. <laughs> that totally makes sense. Well, great. This is super helpful. Uh, I, I love these six steps. This has been really helpful. I've taken away a couple of real nuggets and pearls today. So I call that a huge win. I want to I want to ask you something now that may seem a little bit off topic in the moment, but I've been I've been sitting with this since we about halfway through our conversation. Uh, you are about the most laid back animal behaviorist that I have ever <laughs> talked to as far as your ability to be like, well, you know, like, we'll see what happens. And, um, you know, like uh, when you say, you know, if you hey, if you want to put your dog away instead of. <laughs> You know, the dog who jumps up, you just want to put him away. That's fine. And I'm like, I, wow. <laughs> I, I generally, I have people who are, who are animal behaviors uh, uh, who are like, nope, we're going to fix this. And you're like, nah, you know, like, like find what I'm, works. I'm a realist. I am very much a realist. And, and again, it. I'm also a client to a certain degree, right? I have pets. They're not all perfect. Um, certainly my children are not perfect. And so you have to roll with the punches. And if you, if management is all you can handle, have at it. Management and mental enrichment, I'm good with you. <laughs> well, so two things. Number one, you and I talked about our kids before we started recording. And so you have a 14 and nine year old. I have a nine and 11 year old. It or, uh, yeah, a, a 14 and 11 year old. It changes your perspective a little bit about what's really important. You're like, look, just get through the day. 
Just, and so I love exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> let's just get through the day. Just, look, just, I, I, we're all just holding it together. Just let's make it work. But, but I, I do, I, anyway, I, I think it's really refreshing. I think a lot of us as veterinarians feel like we're, we, we're not getting it right, or we didn't a hundred percent fix this, or we're not fixing it as fast as we should. And I just want to tell you, I, I really like your perspective. And I think that you make me feel much more competent with, with, with a more laid back attitude of, you know what, we're going to, we're going to work on this and some of it's not going to work and we're going to kind of keep adjusting. But anyway, I just, uh, I, I'm struck by that talking to you. I think it's really, it's really awesome. Um, where actually, let me ask you this real quick. What are your favorite, do you have favorite behavior resources out there? So if you're a veterinarian or a technician and you're like, this is my jam, uh, wh where do you send people to? Yeah. I mean, even if it's not your jam, like if you want more resources just for clients, um, the five minute vet consult, uh, canine feline behavior one is one of my favorites. Um, I give it to all my students when they come on rotation. Um, I love decoding your cat and decoding your dog by the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. You might see a chapter in one of the books by yours truly. And those are great for clients too. Like I, I love being able to put those into puppy and kitten packs. Like if I were in general practice, that's what I would do. I would put one of those books in every single one of my puppy and kitten packs and send those home with owners because that is going to be an invaluable resource for the life of that animal. Those are great. Those are great. I'll put links to all that stuff in the show notes. Those are great books. Decoding your dog and decoding your cat, and a hundred percent written for for pet owners as well. Like really good call. Really great. Uh, really great recommendation. Amy, where can people find you online? Where can they learn more about your practice? Uh, things like that. Yeah. Well, you can find me um, at our website at abwellnesscenter.com. And our Facebook page is the same, AB Wellness Center. And uh, we put lots of resources up there, lots of success stories from our patients, um, good ideas for management. We have a fun little uh, post recently of a dog with his nice little bandana that says, don't touch me. So um, advertising his management to others. That's so great. We love that type of stuff. So I wish I had a, ban a bandana that said, don't don't talk to me sometimes. <laughs> That's I was what I said too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> That's so great. No hey, thank you. Thank you. No hugs. Uh, no, thank you so much for being here. You were really wonderful. Guys, uh, everybody, take care of yourselves. Thanks uh, Thanks for listening. I will talk to you next week. And that's it, guys. That's what we got. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Amy Pike, for being here. Gang, um, I love this. I love uh, I love talking about this stuff. I love learning. I love getting better. If you uh, want to get your team on board with episodes like this, just share it with them. We uh, It's available uh, on YouTube. If uh, you have people who like to watch the podcast on YouTube, it's wherever you get your, uh, your podcast. You can tell Amazon Alexa to play the latest Tone of Shame veterinary podcast and she'll do it. And so you got that going for you. It's easy to bring the team in. Also, if you want to work with your team on making good recommendations and communicating more effectively with pet owners, I got you there too. You can head over to drandyrourke.com and click on our store. And I have a course, which is my exam room communication course for teams. It is my best advice and practices for training teams to work with pet owners. Uh, check it out. It is really, uh, man, it's, it's my best. It's my best resource that I could possibly make to help teams work better in the exam room. I hope that you'll find something valuable in it and that you and your team can get something out of it. I bet you can. Anyway, guys, take care of yourselves. Be well. I'll talk to you soon.